Okay, I think uh, we've probably wasted long enough. We've got some speakers that are keen to get going, so uh, I think we'll make a go. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I can see there's 94 people have joined us and that's terrific and, and thank you. It's great to see such enthusiasm for the topic. So um, I'm Rob Middleton. I'm Associate Professor of Disease Reg uh, Registers here at Swansea University um, and uh, I'm a researcher and I've been involved with the UKMS Register since it started in 2011 as have uh, a couple of my co-speakers here actually they've been been with us since the start and I'm, I'm very grateful that they've joined us and we've got to the the scale now that we can do these kinds of things and, and really sort of get more information out to, to what's going on with the register so I'm delighted to welcome you here today and this webinar is on progressive MS and clinical trials we've uh, four excellent speakers for you um and we'll go through them as, as, as we as we go along so uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before I uh, launch into the first speaker so the webinar is being recorded. As you can see, your cameras and mics aren't active as part of this, so your privacy will be maintained. And hopefully we'll make this available on YouTube uh, after the fact to keep this information sort of live and for those people who have been un unable to join us. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions as you go if you type them into the chat. Beth from the MS Society will be monitoring the chat and we'll be hopefully have a bit of time to go through those questions as we go through it. We're not going to answer anything uh, specific to your case uh, for medical advice, so please try and keep the questions general uh, about the trials and about what's going on, rather than for your specific case. So these are our speakers. We've got Catherine Godbold from the MS Society, we've got Professor Klaus Schmier, Professor Jeremy Chataway, and, and Jacqueline Car uh, Carup, who we're going to go through the various bits and pieces that we're talking about here. I will shush very quickly and let Catherine get on and tell you a little bit about what progressive MS is. And she's our first speaker, so I'll hand over to you now, Catherine. Just going to share my slides. Oh, we skipped ahead. All right. So, hi, everyone. And um, thanks, Rod. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming along today. I'm Catherine. I'm really excited to be here and to be able to listen to Jeremy and Klaus and Jacqueline. Um, so as Rod said, I'm from the MS Society and we're the largest charitable funder of MS research in the UK. So we fund some of the research you're going to hear about today. I won't take up much of your time at all, but we thought it might just be helpful before we get into the detail of some of the exciting research to just do a quick overview of what's going on in your body when you have progressive MS and what we think we need to do to get to a place where we can slow or stop progression for everyone. And obviously many, maybe all of you will already know absolutely loads about this, um, but we just wanted to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So I'll just start with a really whistle-stop tour of what MS is. And if this is already completely familiar to you, to you, please forgive me. So as I expect most people know, MS is a condition that affects the central nervous system. Um, so that's made up of the brain, the spinal cord and the optic nerve. And the central nervous system contains billions of nerve cells. And these nerve cells are responsible for transmitting messages around our bodies as electrical signals that jump from nerve to nerve to nerve. And those messages make everything that we do possible, talking, walking, eating, speaking, everything. And if your MS is progressing, it means that some of your nerve fibers have become damaged and the nerves been lost. And that happens in a process that we call neurodegeneration. So then those messages can't get through, and this can cause the gradual, steady worsening of MS symptoms. And that's when you might get a diagnosis of progressive MS. For a small number of people, this happens right from the start, in which case you might be diagnosed with primary progressive MS. For others, it can follow a period of relapsing MS, where symptoms flare up and are followed by periods of some relief. And then it's called secondary progressive MS. So for a long time, we didn't have a good understanding of how damage is caused in progressive MS, but we are learning more and more about it. And then we can use this knowledge to design new treatments. So we now think it's a combination of factors that causes MS progression. So just a few examples. Myelin um, is the special fatty substance around our nerves that gets damaged in MS. And though our brains have a system for repairing this damage, the repair system can stop working as well. And when the body can't repair myelin, that nerve fiber, fiber loses its protective coating, leaving it vulnerable. We also think that when myelin is damaged, debris and toxins can build up around the nerves, causing more damage. And then also, the nerves don't seem to get the energy they need to work properly because mitochondria, so these are the so-called energy powerhouses of the cells, they can also be damaged or not work properly. 
And over time, it's this environment that can cause nerve fibers to die. I also wanted to just add a quick note on activity because this is a term we hear more and more, but I know not everyone is familiar with it. So some people who have ex are experiencing progression might also have an active form of MS. And that just means that the myelin coating around your nerves is being attacked by cells in your immune system. So they're mistaking the myelin for foreign invaders like infections. Now this usually happens more in the earlier stages of MS. So I'm sure Klaus will talk about this a bit more later. And it can be experienced as relapses or seen as lesions on an MRI scan. So the existing treatments of both primary and secondary progressive MS, so things like oprilizumab for primary progressive MS and saponimod for secondary progressive MS, they work by reducing these immune attacks, which is why people are only eligible if they're showing signs of this activity. So we desperately need treatments that tackle the other aspects of progression as well. So just a brief note on why do some people get MS? Well, we don't know for sure, but we do know there isn't just one single factor that causes it. So scientists think it's a mix of genetic, lifestyle and environmental factors working together to cause the condition in some people. So more than 200 genes have been linked with MS, but it's not directly inherited from our parents. So there's not one gene that causes it. Low levels of vitamin D can increase your risk of developing MS and certain infections and lifestyle factors such as smoking can play a role too. So I wanted to touch on Epstein-Barr because you might have seen it in the news, there's been quite a lot of coverage about the Epstein-Barr virus in the last year or so. So um, Epstein-Barr is a virus that around 95% of us have in our bodies by the time we're adults. And it's mostly asymptomatic, but it can cause glandular fever in some people. And we've known for a while that the virus might be linked to MS. And this year, there's been new research published providing the strongest evidence yet that suggests there is a causal link between EBV and MS. But most people who are infected with EBV don't go on to develop MS. So even if EBV is usually required to trigger it, it can't be enough to cause it by itself. So we need to know a bit more, but obviously this does open up the question of whether preventing EBV could then prevent MS. For that, we obviously need an EBV vaccine, which doesn't exist yet. Um, but there are some trials going on in America, I think, um, testing potential vaccines for EBV. Um, but we're still quite a long way from seeing if it could actually prevent MS one day. So 30 years ago, we had no treatments for MS. Now there are over a dozen treatments licensed for relapsing MS. And in the last few years, we've had a couple of new treatments licensed for active progressive MS, as I mentioned. This progress is great, but obviously there's a huge amount more to do. And our fundamental research goal is to get to a future where everyone can live without worrying that their MS is going to get worse. So we've talked to lots of researchers and we believe that there's three key things we need to be able to do in order to stop MS. So firstly, we do need to stop immune cells from attacking myelin in the first place. As we've talked about, we've seen incredible progress in this area of research and that's how all the treatments currently licensed for MS work. So they do that in different ways, things like killing rogue immune cells, preventing them from getting into the brain, trapping them in other parts of the body. The second strategy is finding ways to promote the repair and the replacement of damaged myelin. And our brains have this natural ability to repair damaged myelin, as I said. So nerves with damaged myelin will signal for help and stem cells will travel to the site of the damage and they turn into the myelin making cells. You can see those little myelin making cells in the cartoon. And then new myelin is put on the nerves. But in MS, it doesn't work as well as it should, this process. So scientists are looking for ways to kickstart this natural process. But as I said earlier, the progression of disability in MS isn't all down to myelin damage. We know that the nerves themselves can stop working properly in different ways too. So we need to protect those nerves and make them as strong and healthy and happy as possible. So our researchers are looking for ways to keep our nerves healthy by doing things like making sure they've got all the energy they need, improving the transport of important molecules around the nerves, and then clearing up debris left over from myelin damage. That's what this little pat round dude is doing. So our vision is that ultimately it'll be a combination of these three strategies that will enable us to stop the progression of MS. And at the MS Society, we're funding research into all three areas, both in the laboratory and in clinical trials. I'm not going to go into detail on the trials, as you're going to hear from the real experts in a second, but I thought it might just be useful to see 
the landscape of trials that we're funding now for progressive MS and progression in MS. So we've got chariot MS, looking at whether we can prevent immune attacks and slow progression in more advanced MS, which Klaus is going to talk about. We've got our very catchily named CCMR2 trial at Cambridge University, a very small trial, um, but they're testing a combination of two drugs um, and seeing if it can boost myelin repair. And then we've got the phase three SAT2 trial, um, which is testing whether a common cholesterol lowering statin can slow progression in secondary progress MS. So Jeremy's leading that trial. And of course, Octopus. So Octopus is currently testing neuroprotective drugs, but has the potential to add other drugs going forward. Um, and yeah, with that, I will now hand over to Klaus to talk to you about Chariot. Wonderful. And uh, thank you very much, um, Catherine. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining um, this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to talk about CHARIOT, which stands for Cladobin to Hold Deterioration in People with Advanced MS. Um, you can also follow me on X now. Um, yes, and what we um, were thinking about when we conceived the studies, um, uh, was obviously the uh, MS uh, society's priorities and top of the list uh, is um, and remains which treatments are effective to slow, stop, or reverse the accumulation of disability. I trust you can hear me. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and um, as Catherine already alluded to, there's there have been a lot of um, uh, treatments coming through for people with earlier. A disease, relapsing uh, MS, um, and also a couple of treatments with um, progressive MS. However, it's a little bit like dangling a sausage in front of people who are unable to walk. Okay, so, um, and that is um, a substantial number of uh, patients uh, and people with uh, MS. So you can see about 35 to 40% have this EDSS of 6.5 or above. Um, and that stands for well, you're essentially um, using a wheelchair or you're in, indeed dependent on a wheelchair uh, for mobility. Um, we're trying to change this. Chariot MS really focuses on people at this uh, stage of the disease. And in fact, um, this is from the website, um, and Christine, who is a person with advanced MS, has uh, greatly helped um, to develop this, and as a member of the trial management group, um, advises on everything really patient-related that we don't see ourselves. And uh, so I um, really encourage you to go and visit there. You find the trial sites involved in the study uh, and so forth. This is um, patient number one, who is uh, in fact um, uh, about to complete uh, Chariot MS. She, um, uh, Carol, uh, who is a painter, um, and uh, she will complete her last visit next Monday. This is another um, um, member of the Chariot community who is here um, riding actually his chariot, and uh, which is his hobby and uh, is also part of uh, the trial. And uh, here we've got um, Tina in the middle, just surrounded by the team yesterday at the Royal London, who is um, participant number 100. Um, and as you will learn, we're looking for 200 uh, altogether to complete uh, the study. Now, we're obviously talking about um, advanced MS and that it's kind of um, unfair people don't have treatment when they're in the wheelchair, but um, in order to convince funding bodies to fund a study, um, we also need to have good biological underpinning for doing so. And um, so just a brief step back that um, really the core underlying um, principle in MS is that you have an ineffectively regulated immune response that leads to the tissue damage. Certainly at the, at the beginning, that is kind of the onset of it. You can see here in the middle, this hole is kind of a blood vessel and all around here are these inflammatory cells that then kind of move outwards until this kind of peters out. There's probably some inflammation still ongoing in at least a subset of these lesions causing further damage. Um, 
And this is when you look at a serial MRI over 18 months, what it looks like, um, that these lesions occur and some of them uh, become less visible after some time, uh, but they leave a scar uh, and, and uh, are not in, entirely gone. Now, for some time, we, we believed or the community was very much thinking that inflammation happens in the beginning and then progression happens sort of later on, but we've come to, uh, to understand that both elements play a role in MS throughout, from the very beginning, um, throughout uh, the condition. And um, so there's a term now, um, sort of slowly burning or smoldering MS that some of you may have heard, but there's good pathological underpinning from people who have lived with MS and then donated their um, central nervous system for research after they passed away. There's a very large study that uh, demonstrates that uh, in four out of five people with um, MS at this very late stage, you still find inflammatory lesions. And that is um, uh, not good for uh, people with the condition. There's another element that we uh, think plays an important role, and that has to do with the outcome measure. I'd already alluded to the leg function that is so important uh, in uh, previous clinical trials, uh, but that in MS, problems with your legs, but less so with the upper, uh, your upper limbs uh, occur earlier or over time in the disease, maybe due to the length of the nerves in the CNS. And when you look at the brain here and the spinal cord, um, there is one inside, for example, that over half of the motor tracts, uh, for example, they terminate at this level. So you have essentially by uh, default a smaller number of tracts that lead down to the legs. And then there's another uh, element, which is that when you have lesions that are distributed over the um, central nervous system as a result of MS, you have a higher chance of that leading to functional damage in your lower extremities. So this is LE, lower extremity versus the upper extremity. And this is illustrated by this little drawing um, um, uh, by John Kurtzke, um, the actual inventor of the EDSS, no less. So you can see here when you have a lesion up here and down there, you uh, may have still normal function. But over time, you have more lesions and you get a slower conduction in the nerves and therefore develop symptoms in the lower limbs, but um, perhaps not quite yet in the upper limbs. But you may lose function with, as you get more lesions and um, may have some symptoms in the upper limbs, but um, that may still be um, uh, able to reverse or to protect at least from further damage. So why we're using cladribin, which is um, the drug we're testing in this um, study? Well, we have good evidence that it's effective in uh, relapsing MS. There's also preliminary evidence that it works in more progressive uh, MS. In fact, in the US, it is licensed for uh, people with relapsing um, a disease who are progressing. It's a convenient therapy. It's been given um, only in uh, two weeks in year one, and then in two weeks in year two. Um, it is a small molecule that um, actually penetrates into the center nervous system. We believe that has an advantage over drugs that only work in the so-called periphery in the rest of the body. Um, uh, since um, the blood-brain barrier changes over time, in the um, uh, in uh, over the disease, and it is a very uh, safe uh, com uh, compound. Certainly, when you compare it uh, to other uh, drugs in terms of infections, the uh, cancer risk is not exceeding um, uh, uh, other that of other disease-modifying treatments. And uh, there's also COVID-19 safety has been good. This is the study overview. Um, it's a straightforward. Uh, two-arm trial. It's a placebo-controlled uh, trial. Uh, here you can see the short intervals of treatment. Um, the novelty in this study is that the primary outcome uh, is um, the upper limb function measured using the non-hole peg test. Um, there's another novelty, which is that there's no upper age limit. 
Um, and of course, that we're focusing on people with an EDSS of 6.5 to 8.5. That means those in a wheelchair uh, or largely using that. There's a lot of other outcome measures, uh, including MRI and health economics. We're also asking questions to your uh, carer, uh, and, and that will all feed into the analysis. Um, this is just a moment to thank everyone who is supporting the study. These were the SeedCorn funders, but this is really a, a study that is funded by the NIHR uh, with very strong support by the MS Society, um, also the National MS Society, the US, Sparse Charity, and Merck, who are uh, providing funding plus um, uh, the medication and the placebos. And there's also been very good support by the uh, by other stakeholders really in the community. So thanks to all of them uh, for supporting um, this trial. These are the 20 trial sites that are currently open. Um, there's two more to come in Stoke and Coventry, but you'll find all this information really on the website or you just email us um, and to find us on social media too. Um, here's the two, one trial manager and monitor at QM and Harpreet who has also just joined us. This is the recruitment. Um, we've just celebrated number 100, uh, as uh, il uh, uh, illustrated earlier, and this is where we want to get to, 200 uh, by the end of next year. With your help, we'll get there. Uh, maybe you'll um, recognize one of those consultants who are involved in the study, and um, uh, if you do and you've got advanced MS, then um, do contact them to be um, considered for the study. So thanks very much. And I'll hand back to Catherine. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Close. I'm not Catherine. Uh, back to Rod. Um, Apologies. <laughs> that's all right. Um, thank you, Close. That was really interesting. We we will, uh, I said at the outset, we'll pause for questions at the end if you, if you type them into the chat, then we'll, tr we'll try and get to them. Uh, and once again, thank you, Close, for that. Uh, at this point, I'll hand over uh, to Jeremy Chataway, who's Professor of Neurology at University College London and is, is the PI of the Octopus trial. And hopefully, uh, Jerry's in a position to take it away. Thanks very much. I'll uh, get my picture on a moment while I just... Uh... See if we can just get this going. And uh, so, um, well, really, thank you very much indeed for asking me to speak in the MS Register. It's always a great uh, privilege uh, to join these meetings. And really, I'm adding on um, to the talks that you've already heard. And it's very much a team effort, as you've heard, as we, in our different ways, but unitedly uh, look to tackle progressive multiple sclerosis. And I'm going to talk about the octopus trial. This is entirely funded um, by the UK MS Society. Um, so it is a fantastic um, program um, from the Stop MS Appeal. And uh, it's hosted um, by UCL and the Medical Clinical Trials Unit um, there. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of how it came to be um, and what we're doing in it. Um, talk a little bit about the setup. Um, these big programs are not trivial and they take time, but we've, we've got there and we've kind of got into the launch stage and um, where we are and then where we'll be going through this. So really what we're trying to do is to speed up clinical trials in progressive multiple sclerosis because they just take a long time. And um, why do they take a long time? Um, I think a number of reasons. Um, first of all, to measure progression takes time. You can't do it quickly because you just won't see a signal. You need to assemble um, all of the funding and all the um, bureaucracy and administration um, that goes with it. You need to design the protocol and take it through the regulatory um, authorities. So these are legally mandated um, elements to this. This is, as its name suggests, a multi-arm. So we're trialing more than one medication to try and speed up efficiency. And if you like, we're gluing together uh, different stages of the trial, the so-called mid-phase, the phase two, and the final phase, the, the phase three, and we're gluing them together. And I'll show you that. And we're very much um, supported and have been by the UKM Society, but also a massive um, a patient involvement through a very active, a vigorous, and always enthusiastic PPI body. And we really do 
think that. And what we're trying to do in this trial is really is, is look at the other sides of the coin. We've talked about the inflammatory component, which is very important, but here we're trialing, well, can we, can we find elements that can neuroprotect? Could we get to repair regeneration um, under the same vehicle, which is the octopus trial? And so as you've heard, what we're trying to do in progressive, either secondary or primary progressive MS, is reduce the activity, so reduce the relapse activity and the MR activity, and we're, we, we've, we have success there um, with Cipiconomod and Ocrelizumab. Of course, um, there are sort of regional differences, but we have some success there, um, which has really opened the door into progressive MS, where for really many years we hadn't find, found treatments that could have an effect on the progression. But then we want to do more than that. Um, we want to slow down the gradient of progression and we want to stop the progression ultimately reverse progression so that really is it in the encapsulating these sorts of pictures so this is the schema just to kind of get to the the nub of it um octopus was chosen by uh, the community it's an excellent name and talks about the multi-arm so we have the multi-arm multi-stage the so-called man's design and we were inspired um, by this by my colleague, Professor Max Palmer, who leads the, directs the clinical trials unit, who'd really revolutionized um, with his colleagues the treatment of prostate cancer. So for many years, there have been no improvements in metastatic or widespread prostate cancer in men. And then using these sorts of designs, testing more than one com compound, making it a continual process They've changed practice on five or six occasions in the last 15 years or so. So here we have, we randomize, as Klaus has said, the computer decides which arm you're in, and you'll either be on the control arm or the active arm one or active arm two, and, and no one will know. It's really important to say that everyone is always on the best standard of care. So if, you and your neurologist feel that you should be on siponimod, you'll be on siponimod, or you'll be on ocrelizumab or other compounds as they come through. So it's something on top of the best standard of care to see if ultimately we can improve the best standard of care. And in this design, the first stage is about three is 375 people with progressive MS. So secondary, primary, those that are wheelchair bound, for example, and we have an age limit of 70. And then those 375 people are randomized, and then we do scans, the MRI scans, to see if we can see a, a difference. So we're measuring here the, the change in the brain, the so-called atrophy. So all of our brains shrink a little bit and a little bit more in progressive MS, and we can follow that through and if we see that these medications are reducing that, then they cross that hurdle and carry on. We carry on randomizing people into the trial so that we measure ultimately what counts, which is a measure of disability. And here we are using a, a, a multi-component, so measuring the, the walking, the arm function, um, and other elements. And that is the final outcome. Now, if we get to that middle stage, and a medication isn't working, we can drop it. And then after about six months or so, patients or people who want to take part can come back into trial and be re-randomized if they're eligible. And then we aim very much to bring in new treatments. So we have here arms A, B, and C. So bring in an arm D, uh, for example, and that's active work looking for the best treatments um, that we can find. And so you might say, to, well, how do you find these treatments? And this is work we did with many um, colleagues and friends with the UK AMS Society, looking down all of the possibilities, all of the treatments that have shown some promise in animal and experimental work. And we spent a lot of time sieving that through to come through the short list that you can see on the right there. There were nine uh, possibilities. And so we picked um, the top two of those which I'm going to describe, and they're the initial medications that we are testing in Octopus. And this is a continual process. We have an ongoing committee looking for new options, 
or to see how the other seven medications are doing as more information comes on around the world. So the first compound is what's called lipoic acid or alpha lipoic acid, ALA. So this is actually used quite commonly in Germany and um, with the treatment of diabetic nerve damage, but it does a number of possible things that you can uh, illustrate it here. So they could, it can protect the energy, energy uh, cassettes, the mitochondrial. It can interrupt the um, release of dangerous oxygen species molecules could stabilize the blood brain barrier. So a number of possibilities um, where it could be useful in progressive multiple sclerosis. And so a lot of work has been done on this, particularly um, by a group in Oregon uh, led by Rebecca Spain and who's a, a key collaborator um, in this program. So she did a, a trial where she took 50 people with progressive MS and she followed them over time. She randomized them to the dummy drug in blue or the real drug in red. And she did that following of the brain, looking at the brain atrophy, the shrinkage. And as you can see, being on the red line, the lipoic acid gave relative protection compared to the dummy in blue. And so that stimulated us, that's that piece of human evidence that lipoic acid as one of our active treatment arms. And this is over a two year period and the areas in red are where that brain structure that has, has, has um, been removed, if you like. So that's the atrophy, that's the shrinkage. And we can measure that with special registered MRI scans to see if these compounds reduce that down. And that's the first hurdle to carry on in this trial. And then the second drug um, was metformin. So a very interesting drug, which is used a lot in diabetes, but clearly does much more than that. And again, this is work, experimental work from the Cambridge group, showing that it can be helpful in protecting, regenerating these mitochondria, maybe enhance recovery of that myelin, which as Catherine said, is so important, and also a number of other um, elements here. So metformin, and you'll notice that these are repurposed drugs. So they're drugs for other um, indications. And that means that we don't have to do any of the toxicology coming into trial. It's well known because they're being used on millions and millions of people. And that's really helpful in starting this sort of work. And uh, so metformin is our second pick um, for this. And it may also speak to the, the metabolic fasting um, component, which looks as if that could be important in, in multiple sclerosis. So those were the picks. And then of course we had to assemble the team. We had to write the protocol. We had to get uh, the recruitment going. And I won't take you through this, but there's an awful lot of stuff to do. And Klaus will know this very well. Um, in terms of starting up a trial which is under, as I said, uh, strict um, regulatory guidance. So all of that was done. The team, the we have a home trial team at the MRC Clinical Trials Unit. And as I said, I work very closely with Max Palmer who did this work and does this work um, in cancer studies. And so it goes on. We had to design the database. We had to source the medication. Um, the lipoic acid is made in North America, and then that's transported um, into England. And then it and the metformin and the dummy drug, we have to apply the capsules over them. So it is a blinded process to avoid the introduction of bias. And so here we have the sites. So up and down the country, again, great colleagues and friends taking part in this, the majority taking part in the MS STAT 2 trial and previously MS SMART trial. And so we're just gradually um, opening this up now. And uh, we've opened up the London site, we've opened up Cambridge, uh, sorry, we've opened up the London site, we've opened up Edinburgh, and we're opening shortly um, Wales, Northern Ireland, and then the other uh, trial sites as well. So we have about 15 sites that will set up in the first stage and then we'll join by another 15. 
We have a website, lots of resources um, available for all of the investigators and participants, and that's freely available. Please, please have a look at that. So this is the recruitment curve um, about six weeks ago. It's now over 30, 35. So we're coming along, um, mainly driven by the London site, which is fine. We opened that and then the other sites are coming on um, and are randomizing their patients um, around the United Kingdom. And again, on the left, we just see some of the, the sites that uh, are working our way through the, with the site visits and then starting recruitment. So important to us is, is how people who want to take part can get involved. So trying to reduce the barriers to entry. So rather than doctors and nurses writing letters to um, investigators, clearly is much better if people can identify themselves in an automatic, if you like, um, process. And we've identified with the MS register um, a portal, a patient portal, that people can start to enter their details if they're interested in Octopus, that's freely available um, through the um, UK MS Society, UK MS Register. And then we can do some basic filtering processes uh, to make sure that the trial is right for them and they're right for the trial, also where there's their, their nearest centre um, as they come online. So we've learned this from the MS Stat 2 and MS Smart trials that uh, this is a very useful thing um, to do. And this is we've made this mandatory it's not it's not difficult and do it yourself or with a friend or with a relative or with a nurse um, to enter into this and so this is a registration of interest it's all anonymous and ultimately and kept confidentially and then patient details are released um, confidentially to sites um, as they come online and we have a full screening process through that and then sites receive lists and then the team will ring um, people who are interested to do some pre-screening. And so it will reduce, as it were, the chance of a person coming into screen face to face where it's not suitable um, for them. And there is in this study, there's a travel budget so people can come to centres. So this is June. I think there are about 2000 people who are potentially um, interested, which is fantastic, but the more the merrier because some of those people won't be suitable for the trial. Um, and it's really, really important to us that as many people are um, engaged in this trial process. This is just a snapshot saying people where they, where their nearest centres were, uh, London, Cambridge, Edinburgh, Leeds, Southampton and so on, so forth. Another innovation is that we've developed what are called hubs as part of this sort of, sort of super recruitment area. So there's a um, where they get some extra resource as part of this trial. So excluding deliberately London, excluding deliberately Edinburgh, which are the, um, the number one and two areas, we've um, supercharged, if you like, um, Southampton, Coventry, and Belfast um, as part of this um, process um, to just really kind of reach out and as, make it as, as best as possible for people to come into this trial. Lots of publicity um, with this trial. You may have seen some of it. We had a very successful launch. Uh, Catherine was involved in that um, about three months ago. A great publicity with the BBC and radio and articles. And we, we really kind of launched it then. Um, and then we'll carry on working that through on a, on a regional basis. Um, and this is one of the trial fellows, um, Sean, who, as you can see, is going through. Um, we have our classical symbol um, in the background who's going through. Um, this process and Karen and Wyatt a big uh, thank you to her um, who's one of the BBC Radio 4 presenters who has multiple sclerosis that's well known and she's a real champion to us when she come we come to this sorts of um, work and she spent a lot of time and um, working this up with the MS Society. Very important is an EDI program and Emma Talentar from Cardiff leads on this really making sure that we do fulfill um, these these goals as we want to and also in this trial, um, we want to take some uh, samples. Um, if people give consent, many do, so that we can store them and end up with a library, if you like, for future res research. And so we have um, the major centres involved in a biobanking um, study, and that's um, kept in Cardiff. So we develop this library, if you like, in Cardiff. Um, that's 
ourselves, but particularly you know, people um, below the, the lines in the middle, um, all of those involved in setting this up and maintaining it. Um, you can see the wide range of people that are required from project managers, data managers, statistician, clinical fellows. And, uh, and that's us. And of course, um, ultimately a big shout out to the MS Register and to the UK MS Society. And Rod, that I'm sure is enough from me. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. That was a, a great overview of, of what's going on with Octopus and, and you know, trials in general for, for um, everybody who's listening, I'm sure. Uh, brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move swiftly on um, to, to Jacqueline. Um, Jacqueline is a participant of trials and just wants to give a bit of uh, personal experience of what, 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 what has gone with her. And without further ado, we'll hand over to Jacqueline. Hello. Um, my name's Jacqueline Crarup. I'm 61 years old and I have two grown up children and live with my husband and my late Lynn Terrier, who I was hoping was going to participate in this um, screen as one of my um, slides. But anyway, he's disappeared now. Uh, but as you can see in the background is one of the classical symbols, as Jeremy calls it, the octopus. I've been living with secondary progressive MS for um, the last um, about 10 years now, the last couple of those in a wheelchair. And I experienced my first symptoms of relapsing remitting MS, um, or that, although I didn't realize it at the time, um, about 20, well, when, in my, when I was in my late 20s. I'd never participated in any clinical drug trials before. So when I signed up for STAT2 in the autumn 2018, I wasn't sure what I was letting myself in for, um, other than I knew that I would be in good hands. And I can assure you that if you're signed up to that trial or you'll be signing up to Octopus, you will be too. The initial screening for um, STAT2 to confirm the eligibility to take part involved having an MRI scan and then taking various blood tests and various baseline tests. And this included ones for walking, so testing where you were at with your mobility and also with your hands and upper body movements um, and as well as cognition and eyesight um, as we're all familiar those of us with MS that uh, your cognition and eyesight can be affected. After the three year uh, period that I've been on the trial for, my symptoms had progressed, not drastically, but my walking had slowed right down. And I looked at it, I suppose I no longer met the trial pro pro criteria to continue on the STAT2 trial. Uh, which there is an option, I, I do know, to extend the trial um, beyond the three-year trial period. So as um, Professor Chatterway just explained, STAT2 is a double-blinded randomized trial. So neither the patient, uh, myself in this case, or the clinician knows whether you've been taking the real treatment drug or the dummy, dummy drug. I'll just have a sip of water. Um, and the unblinding for that only happens once the last patients to be recruited on the trial, I think I'm correct in thinking that, um, have completed the whole trial period. So I believe that will be about 2025. After, and I'll be honest, my initial disappointment, um, I couldn't let go of the knowledge that uh, with about... 15 or so licensed treatments for relapsing, remitting MS, the researchers and clinicians in the international community must be looking for treatments for um, progressive MS. And for those with scores like mine on the EDS scale of six and a half and above. And as we've just heard um, from Professor Chatterway and, um, and Professor Schmira, they are. And in May this year, I was very um, excited, I suppose, um, one better way of describing it, to, to start on the Octopus trial. And uh, I started at Queen Square Medical Centre in, in London. And as uh, Professor Chatterway has just explained, there are two 
repurposed uh, treatment drugs, alpha lipoic, I can never remember the correct name, but I believe alpha lipoic acid, which is being tested and metformin with a placebo drug. So three drugs on the trial and I was randomized and allocated onto one of those treatments. I experienced minor reactions, uh, both to the drugs back on the um, STAT2 trial, uh, which were very small drugs compared with the, the octopus ones. I did have very minor effects, but any initial ill effects have been far out, outweighed, I have to say, by the positives, not least of knowing that I'm taking part in a clinical trial and something is, is being done um, for our community, those of us living with progressive MS. And from a participant viewpoint, there are a few things to expect. And what has helped me are things like including the patient portal, which uh, Professor Chatterway referred to, uh, which is, is the means of signing up um, for registering onto the octopus treatment. And that is available on the MS register, who my experience over the last three, four years have been doing a great job in terms of keeping all the data. And you know, they even are able to show you charts in terms of you know, how your how your treatment, uh, sorry, not your treatment, how your condition is progressing. The inevitable form filling and questionnaires uh, which follow can be completed online. So that's actually been really helpful in terms of, I suppose, speeding things up and also being able to, somebody sitting um, there and helping you, you doing it. And the initial screening call, um, that you will receive from someone from the octopus trial to check, to I suppose check your eligibility to take part is, is, is very straightforward and not difficult. And it's all very well explained. And thereafter the booking system for appointments once you've, you've been in and had your first scan, which is a little bit longer for the octopus trial. It is one and a half hours um, because uh, there is a requirement to have the, um, and I've forgotten the name of it, when they put the dye in, in, in the brain, but um, oh, not in the brain, in the, in the system. Uh, but that's the first uh, scan that you will have. And then you will have another one in, I think it's six months time, just in order to be able to assess um, whether any progression or any um, advancements have been made and in order to uh, then decide whether you will stay on the current treatment that you've been allocated or whether you will be put onto another treatment and that's as Professor Chatterway said the beauty of the multi-arm um, multi-stage trial. When it comes to actually taking the octopus pills and I, I have just um, brought them here just to show you um, they are uh, quite prominent, um, bright, well, not bright blue, but blue. And I'll be honest, I don't know what's inside them, but they are easy to swallow and they are easy to take um, with liquid. So you take, initially it's one in the morning and one in the evening after you've eaten something. And um, as you've settled into the trial after about week one or two, two in the morning, two in the evening. Um, as I said, they do look a little bit like licorice sweets. So I think it's important idea to keep them in a safe place um, out of the way, or in my case, out of the way of um, Magnus, because um, he would find it rather interesting. Um, they, they are also odorless and tasteless. Stick with it. On stat two, I had a short hiatus whilst one of my blood test measurements uh, showed a little irregularity, um, but once that had settled down, I resumed on the trial. And with octopus, I was actually sick with a headache on about week two, but only for a day or so. And I don't know whether that was just my body just getting used to the triation of drugs with all of the other symptom management treatments I'm taking, or uh, whether it'd been just something I'd eaten the night before. So I'd picked up maybe a stomach bug, but all, all, all is well now. 
all is all is well now. I'm in great hands. It's important though also to say manage expectations. As we all know, it's not easy living with a condition that seems sometimes you're thinking it's only heading one way, the wrong way. So I do have to remind myself that I do have a privilege of taking part in this trial. It's groundbreaking. It aims to slow down and hopefully stop the progression of MS so that future generations will benefit. Just as I'm benefiting now uh, with the symptom management drugs that I'm taking, which there would have been patients participating in trials to assure that those were safe and eff 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 efficacious. So taking part, I don't think I've won the right to be on a miracle cure, but I wouldn't be human if I didn't hope. And I remain very, very positive about all the work and very grateful for the work that has been done at such actually alarming speed. Um, and hearing Professor um, Chatway and Professor Shmira speaking about the trials, I think it's, I would encourage if you have the opportunity to take part, if you're interested in finding out more. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, what, what a terrific insight into what, what it's like to be a participant in a trial. And uh, I'm sure everybody found that as valuable as I did. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Klaus has been diligently answering um, questions in, in the Q&A as they've been going along. So I hope people have been seeing the responses to those that have come up. Um, Beth, uh, have we got any additional questions for uh, for, the, for the panelists that you would, would want to ask? Yeah, we have a few come through. One of them is, if you are completing MS Stat 2, how quickly can you put yourself forward for Octopus? Klaus has already answered this question for Chariot, so Jeremy. Uh, si about six months. Um, we have, how, Jeremy, how can you take part if your treatment centre is not listed? Is it possible to be able to transfer to a centre that is recruiting? Yes, I mean, that that is possible. I mean, we try to get good geographical coverage and not every area, but I think um, if you'd like to, um, so certainly um, in London, we're, we're keen to receive applicants. There is a limit to the travel budget. Um, it's about £40 per visit. So if you're living in Orkneys, it would be impossible, I would imagine, to come to London unless um, that was acceptable. But um, we try and be as flexible as we can. And we know how enthusiastic people are, um, but we are just opening up these other sites. So clearly it's better to be at a, a more closely um, apparent site, but uh, we're just sort of, we can always be flexible. I'm always happy to be contacted. Faust, would you like to answer that question for Chariot as well? Yes, um, um, I think we're more generous with the travel budget, um, being um, aware that people are wheelchair users um, and um, Yes, people can obviously be referred from anywhere in the UK to their nearest site. Um, I showed you the overview. That's also on the website. And um, I already had a query regarding Newcastle. Unfortunately, they're not part of the study, but, you know, uh, Glasgow may not be too far away. Or another Scottish site. We've got three. It is possible. Great, we've got a minute or two, so I might ask just one or two more. Um, for both Klaus and Jeremy, when do we hope to see the results of these trials, including MS Stat 2? Okay, maybe I'll, um, so I start Klaus, is that, yeah. Yep. So MS Stat 2, the, the final patient visit will be summer of next year, summer 2024, and then it will take a few months to come to the analysis of that. So we hope to be going public in it with it late 24, early 25 something like that. Um, Octopus, of course, so that's the end of a phase three program. Um, so Octopus, of course, is a sort of starting again, if you like. So we'd have interim results, that first hurdle, um, if you like, in about three years time from now. So that's the, that's the time frames that we're working for. We're hoping 2026 will be first results for Chariot. Um, that have completed recruitment next year 
and then it's two years, and we're hoping for a further extension beyond that. But the first results should be end of 2026, early 27. Jeremy, somebody's asked about biobanking and what samples are taken and used in biobanking. Yes, yeah, so um, blood samples are taken and separating it out, the serum, the plasma, also a DNA sample. All of these are voluntary, um, possible to, to opt in those. We're doing them in, in about three sites to start with. Um, and as I said, they're transported to Cardiff to create this uh, library so that uh, really investigators around the UK, around the world, ultimately can benefit from it. And I think considering it's one minute past five, we'll end up with one last one saying, even though some of the drugs used in octopus and other trials are used for other conditions, why is it so important to take the trials within the setup, uh, to take the drugs within the setup of a trial? Yeah, so, um, these drugs don't have a license or a label for multiple sclerosis. I suppose they could be prescribed off label, um, but they don't. So it's very important to do trials to work out if drugs truly work um, compared to the control. Otherwise, we end up with drugs that we're not sure work because every drug can have side effects. And the worst thing would be to prescribing drugs that don't work and have side effects. So that's why we have to do the, the basic elements of trials of comparison against the control and randomization. But as I, as I said, and everyone is always on the best standard of care. So if a drug X came out next year, which was the best standard of care, this will be added in to the trial medication. But this is the process, in fact, by, what, by which these sort of 15 or 20 drugs have been developed in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis over this transformative period and many of those actually are repurposed drugs drugs that have been used for other things so uh, tecfidera was used in psoriasis oprilizumab is from rituximab so repurposing we're very used to in multiple sclerosis um, but it's really important to do the trials as it is in medicine to make sure that you're not fooling yourself and to make sure that something really does work all right shall i pass that to you rod Brilliant. Uh, you know, thank you all. And thank you for such uh, great questions. And, and thanks to Jeremy uh, and the close for answering them. Uh, I will put up a slide at the end just with all the contact email addresses for everybody so you can see what's been going on. And I hope that we should be able to share a YouTube video as well. So if there's something you missed or you want to go back on and look again, which may also address some of the questions too, uh, then that should be helpful as well. So I will just close up by saying on behalf of myself and, and the MS Register team and, and Ellie who made all this possible on our end as well, thank you very much for your attendance and coming on and asking such good questions. Thank you very much to our speakers and for giving up the time and, and going through the, the trials and, and their experiences and uh, everything that they have up to this point as well. We, we deeply appreciate that. And thank you all for coming and listening. Um, and hopefully we'll do more of these in the future and you found out something useful and, and interesting. We hope you all have a very good evening and I'll mute myself and people can leave and I'll share those slides now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.